Governor Nauru appeals for suspects to turn themselves in. Thousands brave the rain to pay their respects. And claims of foreign missions yet to be paid salaries. This is National MTV News with Hope Imaka. Good evening and thank you for joining us. This is Friday's News. Morabe Governor Kelly Nauru has appealed to the suspects involved in the killing of 10 people in the Makam district to hand themselves over to police. Schools have remained suspended for two weeks and police mobile squads have been stationed in Umi and Mutsing for the last three weeks. Like many violent clashes that result in death, it is expensive for families and provincial and district governments to resolve. Police from three provinces, Morobe, Medang and the Eastern Highlands, have been brought in to boost police presence in the Makam area. They've been here for two weeks to contain the violence. Today, it cost the provincial government an additional 50,000 kina to pay for expenses of families who have gathered. Morobe Governor Kelly Naru has called for calm and for the community to hand over the suspects involved in the 10 murders. Inside the community. Please, you have to keep yourself in. Schools have remained closed for two weeks. Both communities, Mutsing and Umi, involved in the fight started by two drunk high school students, are still in fear of reprisals from either side. Police have been conducting roadblocks to prevent the flow of firearms or any other offensive weapon. This incident has also exposed the weaknesses in policing in the Makam district. Lack of manpower, I mean, yes, uh, they can contain the situation because the people are all come in numbers now. Both sides, uh, also now, every, every common people. Morobe is a large province with its people spread out over the highlands, the islands, and large flat expanses like the Makam. Now, for the whole of the province, there are less than 200 policemen and women. And in some areas, you'll find only one reserve constable who doesn't even have the resources to handle large tribal fights. Scott Waide, National MTV News, Lay. The casket of the late Hela Governor Anderson Agiru arrived in Tari yesterday afternoon. Thousands gathered at the Andaija Oval to welcome their late governor. Prior to that, the casket made a three-hour stopover in the Southern Highlands province. At around 3 p.m. yesterday, the casket of the late Hela governor arrived in Tari on a chartered Air New Guinea flight. <laughs> Finance Minister James Marape, Koma Magarima MP Francis Potape, Koroba Lake Kopiago MP Philip Undialu and members of the Hela provincial government were present to welcome the body. Members of the PNG Defence Force escorted the casket through the streets of Tari. The sound of weeping filled the town as the casket made its way to the Andaija Oval for the first funeral service in Hela. The heavens opened with a heavy downpour, but the Hela faithful withstood the rainfall to be part of the program. Prior to handing over the casket to the Hela provincial government, Speaker of Parliament Theo Zurenuo called on the Hela people to change their mindsets and continue the good work left by the late governor. On this last, you may bring him to the chamber. Now this man is one of the number one supporters of this war. Now put him Bible on Parliament. So think to him, now pass him on God. He must come up strong. The leader, the man may can behind him. So walk about, now pass him on all. He can come up straight. Now devil up in the chains. He can come up easy into the country floor you the speaker then handed the casket to the Hela provincial administrator, William Bundle, through a symbolic gesture by handing over the national flag.
we wouldn't have come this far. Speaker Zurinor paid his last respects, followed by local MPs, provincial government members and then members of the public. Hella will mourn for the next four days with several programs planned for Southern Highlands, Jiwaka and Enga provinces. The late Hella governor will be laid to rest in his home village of Dauli. Lorraine Gabina, National MTV News. The opposition has raised questions on why a referendum determining protest by UPNG students was not concluded by the Electoral Commission. The opposition members say while the University of Technology's Senate has allowed their students to conduct a referendum, the UPNG Senate should do the same. The protest is to petition Prime Minister Peter O'Neill to step down following a series of allegations labelled against him. Today marks the second week of the boycotting of classes at both the Waigani and Taurama UPNG campuses. The uh, Metropolitan Superintendent of Morobe, Olay, Mr. Wakambi, to have conducted a very successful awareness campaign in Morobe, Naemi come up good. Unfortunately, the administration of UPNG only pine him some reason or delay referendum law by by not giving excuses about electoral commissioners absence. In the first place, they gave them the okay to do the uh, strike or the forum, whatever. All of a sudden, we change our mind and we can't even write a simple letter to electoral commission to come and then do the uh, conduct the referendum. It's not expensive to uh, travel from uh, Electoral Commission office to UPNG. You're not even flying to Guelala. A news conference is expected to be underway at UPNG at this moment. This follows a meeting today of the University Senate. The conference is set to give an update of the situation at the university. Meanwhile, it's been two weeks since the boycott of classes by students and while it has been suggested that the students may be in contempt of court if they pursue their course, one private lawyer who specializes in democratic governance and leadership thinks otherwise. Adelaide Sirox Kari has more. Even the University of Papua New Guinea Vice-Chancellor Albert Mellam in a new statement said the UPNG administration would be in contempt of court if they were to allow a referendum at UPNG, while the Electoral Commission is yet to conduct a referendum because of the legal implications. The real question now is if the students or organisations will be in contempt of court if they go ahead with the protest. number of grounds. Um, one or two may be issues before the court, but the mere statement uh, that these are the grounds which question the integrity of the Prime Minister and therefore he should step aside uh, is, is not necessarily contemptuous. And the petition doesn't discuss issues that are before the court and they don't discuss the merits uh, or the guilt or otherwise of the Prime Minister in relation to those allegations. And I don't see uh, their petition has been contemptuous. Nemo Yalo said that even the Electoral Commission, by not conducting a referendum, is questioning the independence of the office. I've seen media reports that the Electoral Commission has distanced itself uh -huh. and not to assist the students to conduct an independent ballot because uh, probably their legal advice or their position is that it will be contempt of court. I. You know, one fails to see how Electoral Commission conducting a ballot for the students to determine whether or not to protest as determining and discussing issues that are before the court in relation to allegations that are against the Prime Minister. If you really look at uh, the excuse that the Electoral Commission is giving, um, you wonder whether the Electoral Commission is independent after all. The integrity of the office of the Prime Minister is also another issue. The Prime Minister has maintained that he is duty-bound to protect the office of the Prime Minister so that such things do not happen in the future. But the UPNG SRC has stressed that if he is still occupying the office and implicated in high-profile cases before the court, he is already demeaning the office of the Prime Minister. 
Mr. Yellow agreed with the students. Students and every concerned citizen for the Prime Minister to step aside is to preserve the integrity of the public office. He steps aside. He doesn't necessarily resign as the Prime Minister or a member of Parliament, but he steps aside from that office. There's an acting Prime Minister in place, and then he allows, he goes through the due process. That is the proper thing to do. His right to occupy a public office is underscored by a moral and ethical obligation to the public and the office that he occupies. So, put it differently, a leader who really demonstrates you know, quality of leadership will make his legal rights subservient to the public good and public interest. That's basically what the students are calling for. Mr. Yellow said that only if the students were to be given a court order instructing them not to hold a referendum or to not protest, only then would they be in contempt of court. Adelaide Sirkskari National, MTV News. May 31st has been set as the trial date for the contempt of court case involving parties in the legal battle over the Eastern Highlands Provincial Administrator's Post. The parties include Eastern Highlands Governor Julie Soso, NEC-appointed Provincial Administrators Samson Akunai and Alvin Inamoy, and Personnel Management Department Secretary John Kali. Chief Justice Sir Salomo Injia charged the four for contempt after Inamoy was appointed PA despite a court order restraining the appointment of another person to the post. All four were charged on May 2nd and are out on 1,000 Kina bail each. National MTV News continues after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. The Tourism Promotion Authority conducted a workshop today which included all stakeholders and industry partners. The meeting was focused on reviewing marketing activities for tourism growth in PNG. Participants were invited to contribute to the review of the Tourism Promotion Authority's marketing strategy. The workshop was held to highlight the importance of marketing and managing tourism as critical aspects in a destination country's economic and social environments. TPA's Director of Marketing, Alice Kwaningi, said other Pacific Island countries like Fiji spend significantly on tourism development. The Fijian government provides an equivalent of 40 million kina a year to the Fiji Visitors Bureau and gets a return of about 2 billion kina. PNG's budget, on the other hand, is 8 to 10 million kina a year, of which 4 million goes to overseas markets and 2 to 3 million kina on domestic markets. The marketing of PNG is vital, is a vital component in the development of the tourism sector. Successful marketing will expand the market demand for PNG tourism products this in turn will increase the attractiveness of the sector, both domestic and um, overseas investment. Negative media perceptions have been a continuous challenge for Papua New Guinea. Other constraints include destination competitiveness and investment and a lack of a holistic government approach. Despite this, PNG saw a 4.4% increase in international arrivals in 2015. TPA is now looking at addressing its digital communication needs, which include developing a new website and a mobile app. Up until now, our website has had over a million users and over three million page views. Our most viewed pages are our visa and passport information, accommodation listings, flight and travel information, and our travel brochure downloads. It's expected that by the end of the workshop, TPA and its stakeholders will have reviewed the country's current marketing strengths and weaknesses. It's also expected that a comprehensive list will be acquired of strategies for developing and enhancing tourism products and services. During panel discussions, it was expected that the stakeholders would have identified potential funding and project management strategies despite the current financial situation. Delhi Waigeno, National, MTV News. 
Two weeks before graduating as the first batch of 2016, PNG Defense Force recruits held their last dawn attack exercise today. The exercise took place at a historically significant site. It is a place where in World War II, Australian troops were stationed at Siraka at Gerhu Stage 7, using it as their defense position before going up to Mount Ariyama. Our crew, Vasanata Yama and Quinton Alomp, visited the dawn attack and files this story. The exercise started at 5 o'clock this morning. Normally during war, 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. are the times when the enemy attacks because it is when people are still sleeping. This is the final field exercise where they put in practice their soldiering skills. Each person is carrying cargo weighing upwards of 25 kilograms. They have been trained for three months to master the core skills required of a soldier. These include navigation, basic weapons training, key military knowledge and skills, and rising each day to meet the challenges as a team. The training this morning was for the instructors to assess their skills. Basically, uh, what we're trying to uh, get them to do in the dawn attack is teach them how to do an attack in the, in, the, uh, in the early hours of, of the morning. Lieutenant Colonel Dikas Esso is the commanding officer and chief instructor at the PNG Defense Training Depot in Goldie. After he entered the depot in 2014, PNGDF started the Company of Excellence, where you have the Alpha, Bravo, Charlie and Delta companies. He said 75 of these recruits will go for infantry in Wiwek, which will complete the Company of Excellence. Most of them are between the ages of 19 and 25 years old. And then a soldier has to be physically fit to, uh, to be able to carry that weight, walk long distance, climb hills, cross country, cross uh, rivers, uh, go through swampy areas, so yeah, so those basic needs that he would need, uh, you would expect them to carry in the bush. Lieutenant Colonel Esso says the purpose of recruiting young men and women is to change the image of an aging force to a young and vibrant force. Basenata Yama, National MTV News. More than 100 nurses in Morabe joined hands to commemorate International Nurses' Day yesterday at the Angar Hospital. President Stephen Nowick says nurses around the country continue to be challenged with harsh conditions of employment, yet continue to provide health services. The day, themed on the improvement of health systems, has brought to light struggles nurses encounter when carrying out their responsibilities. Nurses Association President Stephen Nowick, during his speech, raised some of the difficulties faced, which slows down the medical services that nurses provide. One bigger challenge for all the nurses in the country is the, uh, the accommodations, the welfare. Their welfare provides... If nurses are look after, they will deliver quality services. If they don't look after, how do you expect? They're human beings like everyone else. And the majority of that, the nurses are females. He says in the country, the current number of hospital facilities and infrastructure cannot fully cater to the populations that turn up at hospitals for care and treatment. He also says the ratio of nurses to patients at public hospitals are not proportionate as more health workers are faced with a pull factor from private sector clinics offering better worker benefits. The other bigger challenge that we have faced today in this country is the population and infrastructure. You look at this facility, this facility is, cannot cater for today's uh, population in LA. And uh, nurses have to overstretch to meet the uh, patients demand and and the burnout is, is quite common throughout uh, every nurses in the country. The president also raised concerns on the continuous change in governing policies of various hospitals around the country which he says is causing unnecessary confusion among health workers. Colin Barilai, National MTV News, Lay. Today, the International Organization for Migration handed over a disaster response plan to the Waria local level government for the Garina Station and surrounding communities. Amidst Morabe's financial problems is the drought disaster that has struck the province, affecting people in the Waria, Menyama and other parts. 
From lessons learned during the drought, provincial authorities are working with international organizations like IOM to mitigate the losses in the future. Bethany Hariman was in Garaina today and brings us this story. The International Organization for Migration team left Nadzab Airport this morning and flew into Goraina. They arrived there with IOM Chief of Mission George Gigauri, top provincial government bureaucrats, to hand over a disaster plan to the warrior people. After the speeches were given came the signing of the document and the handover. Papua New Guinea is facing its economic challenges. But with that, it is also facing the dry spell. It's a disaster that is being handled by the district authorities, the provincial governments and the national government. But what's more important is that Papua New Guinea is also receiving support from international organizations. The International Organization for Migration is reviving traditional systems of dealing with disasters by honing it with modern ways. The IOM chief of mission says it saves costs on the government and it's effective. And we should use technology whenever we can. That's the point of technology, to help the people. But there are certain areas, like this area here. You can't get to here by truck. You can't drive here. It takes 40 minutes just to fly. So if a disaster strikes, the first responders will be the people here. So what we have to do is find a cost-effective solution that people themselves can do. In other words, it's a bottom-up process. And let's focus on what we already know and what we can do. Saving costs and effectiveness is exactly what the Morobe provincial government needs this time when dealing with a financial crisis and managing the droughts. Deputy Provincial Administrator for Social Services Sheila Haro says the province is surviving on internal revenue that's also facing a shortfall. In terms of the national money coming down, no, we have no control over it. And, uh, you know, it's now middle of the year. We haven't received, you know, 50% or even uh, any, any, any of that under our uh, budget 2016 as yet. But we have e enough internal revenue to keep us, you know, keep the services going. The nationwide drought last year hit Morobe hard and those places severely affected were aided with a provincial government budget allocation of 1 million kina. Like able, we were able to um, manage the fund in a more more efficient way, which we can see that the only ones that the only um, communities that were affected were given the uh, priorities of the relief relief assistance. The people of Goraina now have a plan, but the implementation of the plan remains to see when disaster strikes. But the IOM team and the authorities say they will not neglect the people. Bethany Harriman, National MTV News, Lei. And now looking at our finance news. The Kina opened five points lower at 0.3160 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina was buying 0.3085 US dollars, 0.4185 Australian dollars, 0.2682 Euro and 33.38 Japanese Yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, cocoa and copra closed lower, while gold and coffee closed the day higher. Copper closed higher, while palm oil and crude oil closed the day lower. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 9.38 points higher, the ASX closed at 39.40 points lower, and the old ordinaries closed at 35.23 points lower. Among stories after the break, the opposition's claims that staff in our foreign missions are yet to be paid their salaries. Welcome back. The financial crisis in Papua New Guinea has hit foreign missions overseas, the opposition has claimed. Opposition leader Sam Basil says PNG high commissioners and embassy representatives in other countries have not been paid for the last two fortnights. Basil says this is embarrassing for the country when staff of overseas missions have not been paid on time. The opposition has claimed that PNG high commissions and embassies in foreign countries are forfeited for two fortnights pay. Opposition leader Sam Basil raised this in a media conference today. 
most of the foreign missions that represent Papua New Guinea through the embassies and high commissions, uh, they haven't been paid for the last two fortnights, and this will be running into the third fortnight. We understand that they are now resorting to collecting uh, visa, visa fee, fees that's normally paid by um, uh, other citizens of other countries that come into Papua New Guinea. Those fees are now collected by those foreign missions and are using as the opera operation uh, funds, including paying their wages. He claimed that office rentals for the foreign missions were also outstanding. The uh, landlords are now closing in on our embassies to, because of non-payment of rental fees. The opposition leader called on Foreign Affairs Minister Rimbing Pato to explain the reasons why the PNG High Commissioners and ambassadors in other countries were not being paid. Um, he must come out clear. Now, I want him to be honest. They were lying to us about the state of the economy. Now, our result will come up now. And try plus same through the high blow, Arab country where country blow, you mean, you got plenty of resources, plenty of money come in, but you mean on a look out in all embassy staff blow, you mean. Now, only kiss him fee blow visa. Now, only use him as some operational expenses. I'm very bad. Few months ago, government employees from various agencies in the country missed their pay packages for a fortnight. This brought to light the state of the economy. But the government has publicly said the country is not broke. But with the issue now on foreign missions missing out on the fortnightly pay, it may sound a different tune to other countries. You cannot tell lies on economic issues. The country is broke. The issue comes at a time when university students rally against the government, calling for Prime Minister Peter O'Neill to step aside for his alleged involvement in approving legal bills to Paraka lawyers and the controversial UBS loan. Quintana Lom, National MTV News. One government source says the Foreign Affairs Department were not aware at an official level on the late remittance of funds to PNG foreign missions. MTV contacted the Foreign Affairs Department but is yet to receive an official response on the issue. MTV did, however, manage to confirm with at least one PNG foreign mission that PNG officials there had not been paid for the last two fortnights. Remains of United States servicemen, mostly females, killed in action during World War II in Papua New Guinea will be repatriated to the United States. A repatriation ceremony proceeded this morning at the Jackson's International Airport in Port Moresby by representatives of U.S. foreign diplomatic missions, U.S. Ambassador Catherine Ebert Gray, and members of the PNG Defense Force. Three caskets of these remnants, mainly uncovered in East Sipic Province, were airlifted from Wewak by U.S. C-17 military aircraft, arrival this morning in Port Moresby, and offloaded to another U.S. aircraft, C-130, to be transported to Hawaii this afternoon. These remains will undergo forensic laboratory testing in Hawaii for identification purposes and also to identify their family members. Later, they will be given a U.S. military ceremonial burial witnessed by their families. And now heading overseas, a couple from northern India after undergoing in vitro fertilization or IVF treatment was blessed with their first child. After 46 years of marriage, both are in their 70s and thrilled to finally have a child together. The mother, Daljinda Kaur, who says she is 70 years old but does not have a birth certificate, according to several media reports, and her husband, Mohinda Gill, aged 79, have been married for over four decades. However, all attempts to conceive a child naturally over the years were unsuccessful. I am surprised over some rumors. Never did my mother-in-law or any other family members ever taunt me for bearing a child at this age. After receiving the IVF treatment at the National Fertility Center in the nearby Haryana province, Carr became pregnant almost 20 years after her menopause. The first two attempts at IVF failed. Dr. Anurag Bishnoi, managing director of the National Fertility Center, where Carr and Gil received the treatment, said that the couple who work as farmers in the neighboring Punjab province heard about the treatment in a newspaper article. 
In India, infertility is sometimes seen as a curse, and those unable to conceive can often end up being disliked by family members. We always had plans to have a baby, but it all depends on God. Nothing can happen without His will. We saw the institute on television and then we decided. But again, we got delayed by two to three years. We contacted them and started taking treatment as advised by them. It's all because of God's blessings. Dr. Bishnoi also said it is not the first case of success for Bishnoi and his center. In 2008, another of his patients gave birth to a baby girl at 70 years old. Lorraine Gabina, MTV World News. A jihadist recruiter linked to the network behind the Brussels attack is walking free. CNN tracked down the man and spoke with the mother of the teenager he recruited, who later died in Syria. Photos from Sabri Rafla's 18th birthday. A family trip to celebrate one of his mother's happiest memories before he went to Syria. We don't know what's happened in Syria, but we are sure with what's happened with with us and Sabri when he was here. Eight months after that trip, Salia Ben Ali says her son became radicalized. He sent her a Facebook message to let her know he was in Syria. Then came a chilling phone call. Là, uh, the Syrian guy said, congratulations, your son just died as a martyr. And then he hung up. It was horrible. When I heard about his death, I felt like I died myself. Benali says her son was the happiest of her four children. She didn't know the most dangerous jihadist recruitment network in Belgium had approached her son. It's known as the Zarkhani Network, made up of veteran jihadists and recruiters. Some would go on to carry out the terrorist attacks in Paris and Brussels. Authorities have prosecuted more than 60 recruiters and foreign fighters. One of them was Sabri Refla. Because there's no proof of death, Refla was still convicted. His recruiters were also declared guilty. As you see here, the judge allowed them to walk free pending their appeal. CNN tracked down one of the recruiters to his home address. This is the neighborhood of one of the recruiters convicted alongside Refla. Refla's mother says her son called him from Syria pleading. Refla wanted to come home. The recruiter said no. We're here to ask him why. Jack, you're revenu? We ring the doorbell. His mother answers. She screams at us to leave her alone. As we walk away, the recruiter appears and confronts us. His words are not welcoming. He refuses to talk to us on camera. Belgian authorities tell CNN they have not notified residents that a convicted jihadist recruiter is living in their midst. We saw a teenaged boy entering the same apartment building. The president of Brussels Tribunal says in Belgium it's not unusual for a criminal to go free while they're waiting for appeal if they're not considered a flight risk. How is it that a convicted member of a terrorist organization sentenced to seven years in prison is allowed to walk free after his trial? Mais le juge qui... The judge assessed that this man's behavior was good throughout the trial and this decision of the judge needs to be respected. For Ruffla's mother, the fact that her son's recruiters are free while he's dead is too much. She says it's as if he's died twice. I don't really believe in uh, human uh, justice, but in a God justice. And he will pay, not here, but by, by God. And uh, I just want to tell him that my son didn't have a second chance like him. Chukai Sports is next. That's after the break. Chukai Sports. Welcome to Chukai Sports. In cricket, first-time host Hebo Baramandis will play against Kenya in two weeks' time. It has been three months since their last international match, and they will not take Kenya lightly as the Africans are bringing some of their most experienced players to the match. Baramandis are now preparing for this match against Kenya as they continue their high-performance training. 
Head coach Deepak Patel said 90% of the games played before were overseas. With Amini Park developing, Baramandis are now able to host an international match for the first time. Uh, unfortunately, we just haven't been able to organise that due to the grand facilities not being made available and uh, there's a lot of issues that we do face. But yeah, look, we'll cut a long story short, uh, we've had to improvise and, 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 and try and uh, play a lot of games uh, amongst ourselves and, and create some competition, uh, but more importantly, uh, playing lots of cricket. And that's what we've been able to do probably in the last couple, couple of weeks. Patel said Kenya also has a good history as they have reached the semi-finals in the World Cup. They will be bringing some of the most experienced and highly skilled players to face the Baramandis. The Hebrew Baramandis playing against Kenya are two very important games in terms of us retaining our, our status in, in the one day, uh, in the ICC one day competitions. Very, very important. Um, and you know, we're not taking them lightly at all. Uh, we know that they've got good history. Head coach Deepak Patel said the match between Kenya and Hebo Baramandis will be an invaluable experience for the Baramandis, considering that they haven't played an international match in three months. Dini Roche Sraiko, National MTV Sports. To football, and there is faith in the national coach. According to PNG Football Association General Secretary Demirit Milang, despite the team's setback in travelling to Korea, the team's travel arrangements fell through at the last minute, with many crying foul over the football administration's handling of the issue. Social media had been a buzz with various factions within the football community in PNG expressing frustration at the PNG Football Association management for what many had claimed was a similar incident to the women's Olympic tragedy. However, those claims had been dispelled by PNG FA General Secretary Dimirid Milang in an interview today. Milang has stated that despite the senior men's team's failure to travel, the team is in lay and will still be looking at a good performance come the Nations Cup. And uh, he thinks that there is, a, there is a great opportunity to get to the next stage, which is the third, uh, third stage of the competition. So we, we, are, we are doing as much as we could to assist the team to prepare. And uh, we are also very optimistic about the outcome. Currently under the guidance of Dane Fleming Seritslev, the PNG men's team achieved a historic victory over the Solomon Islands and Milang has said that PNG FA is quite proud of the achievements of its team preparing for the big tournaments. We have two weeks to go. Uh, Everybody is having sleepless night, I can tell you that. Uh, we make sure that all the countries that come here, because they have heard so much about the Pacific Games, you know, we like to keep the same spirit of of game unity and everything that goes with it. Uh, so everybody's working around the clock and I, I must take my hat off for the, uh, the leading team, which is the uh, LOC. The Solomon Islands have named a strong side for the OFC Nations Cup, with Vanuatu also looking good, whilst favourites New Zealand are in Australia for intense final preparations and Fiji under-20s having returned from a tour of Brazil. Elijah Levet, National MTV Sports. Chukai Sports continues after the break. Chukai Sports. Welcome back. Former Hunters Gary Lowe has returned to the United Kingdom to join the Sheffield Eagles after an unsuccessful stint with the Newcastle Thunders. He joins fellow countrymen Mark Mexico and Menzi Yere with the hope of making a big impact. Lowe won the Interest Super Cup Winger of the Year award when he played with the SPPNG Hunters in 2014. Lowe has been injury troubled and may see him make a possible return to action against Workington Town this Saturday. He has a dislocated shoulder, which saw him miss two games for his new club. With the injury not thought to be serious, head coach Mark Aston had expected to have Lowe back within a couple of weeks. They have decided to give him a cortisone injection to help settle down his shoulder and hopefully get him back on the field. 
Coach Aston says he is confident that Lowe could return ahead of a home clash with the league's bottom club on Saturday. Yeah. Elijah Lavette, National MTV Sports. West Tigers centre Kevin Naikama says Fiji needs a team in the New South Wales Intra Super Cup after seeing the improvement in the PNG Kumuls in last weekend's Pacific Test. Most of the players in the Kumuls were from the SP PNG Hunters in the Queensland Intra Super Cup. Neguamo was disappointed sitting out the Bati's narrow loss to an impressive Kumuls outfit in the Pacific Test doubleheader last Saturday night. PNG. Celebrate a famous victory. Their country will be going off. Fiji's New South Wales Cup bid, led by Fiji and Kangaroos legend Petro Sevenesiva, is expected to soon know whether they will have a chance to feature in the newly rebranded Interest Super Premiership. Neguama hopes for the sake of the development of the game in his home country if the bid is successful. The performance of the Kumuls shows a drastic improvement over recent years, which Neguama says was proof the players had learned from the time competing against Australian professionals. Teased, Watson Ballas kicks, looking for an outside player, but they're wrong gither. Neguama added, the Hunters being in the ISC educates the players in Australia is probably the toughest comp when it comes to rugby league and giving the PNG Hunters exposure to that sort of rugby league definitely makes them better. Elijah Lavet, National MTV Sports. To NRL, the St. George Illawarra Dragons managed to pull off an upset against the Raiders last night, beating them 16-12 in Golden Point. Tonight, we'll see the Parramatta Eels take on the Sydney Rabbitohs at Parramatta Stadium. On Saturday, Penrith Panthers go up against the New Zealand Warriors at 3 p.m. in the first of three matches, followed by a top-of-the-table clash between the Cowboys and the Storms. The final match will see the Broncos play Sea Eagles. On Sunday's doubleheader, Sharks take on the Knights, followed by West Tigers and Bulldogs. And on Monday, Titans play the Roosters. That ends Chukai Sports. The weather details next. Chukai Sports. Chukai Sports. The weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow. In the southern region, chances of shower or two for Port Moresby, mostly fine for Daru and Alatau, a shower or two for Kerma and fine for Popandeta. In the Momase region, chances of showers for all centres except Vanimo, expecting mostly fine weather. In the New Guinea Islands, fine for Loringau, a shower or two for Kavian, brief evening showers developing for Kokopo and Rabaul, mostly fine for Kimbe and few thundery showers for Buka. And in the Highlands region, chances of evening showers, then morning fog for all centres. And in news just in from UPNG, the UPNG Senate has asked students to return to class by next Monday. Chancellor Nicholas Mann addressed the media, saying the university's business is to do with education and not to do with national issues before the court. The Senate has urged students to return to normal classes on Monday because if the boycott continues, the university may be forced to close the academic year. And that's the news, sports and weather this Friday, the 13th of May, 2016. On behalf of the MTV News team, I'm Hope Imaka. Pleasant viewing. Good night. <laughs>